Hey everybody, welcome back. I've got another video for you today from the 2015 MicroHams Digital Conference in Redmond, Washington. Oregon ham Jeremy McDermott, NH6 said, has been working on a software-defined radio project. It's called High Performance Software Defined Radio, or HPSDR. Join me now as we enter Building 37 on the Microsoft campus in Redmond, Washington. Jeremy's up next. Jeremy has an update on the talk he gave last year. Um, I've read it, it's very, very amusing. So, <laughs> um, I'm, everybody knows Jeremy, he's been here a number of years, so I'm not even gonna go in the spiel. He's our resident lawyer that likes to play software engineer, or software engineer that likes to play lawyer. Um, I don't know how to, how I to describe that. I think it's the, the software engineer that likes to play lawyer right now. Uh, my, my software habit tends to fund my law practice, which is not really the way it should be, but that's kind of the way it is right now. That's what happens when your clients are mostly homeless people and college students. <laughs> so uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy to give us an update at HPSDR. So good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully everybody's awake, and uh, hopefully my uh, evil Apple technology will uh, work at Microsoft. So we'll, we'll find out uh, this year. Sorry, it's worth. Uh, yeah, I know. I'm surprised that uh, I, I'm no longer afraid of bursting into flames coming on Microsoft <laughs> campus anymore because they've kind of, kind of friendly to uh, Apple and uh, iOS devices and have decided that they're going to they're going to embrace everything in open source. I don't know. It's kind of a brand new Microsoft. I'm not sure what to think yet. So we'll figure out how that goes uh, now that you guys have gotten a new CEO and uh, he's playing different games. So uh, really, this talk is going to be a, a lot about uh, my adventures becoming a hardware guy. So I'm a software guy that became a lawyer. Uh, and now I'm a software guy that decided that hardware might be a little bit of fun. Um, and dealing with the hardware side of things. So uh, about a half of this talk, the first half, is going to be mostly about uh, the technical aspects of it and uh, what I've been up to over the past year in trying to implement some of my goals. And uh, I'll be honest, the last half of it is kind of a rant about uh, the software guy's frustrations going down the rabbit hole and uh, going into adventures in hardware land. Um, and the preview of that is, uh, I don't think it's really a rabbit hole, it's a rat hole. <clears throat> So I always like to do this slide to uh, let you guys know a little bit about me. But as Kenny said, I'm down with OPP, which means you know me already. <clears throat> and I'm still a lawyer, unfortunately, although uh, I'm not a lawyer here because I'm licensed in Oregon. So it's Washington State. Um, so I get off. And it'll be Grant's job to be the token lawyer. As soon as I cross the border, my magic lawyer powers go away. But as everybody that's seen one of my talks knows, one of my traditions is to have a lawyer joke. Um, but I'm kind of lazy this year, and we'll see if the sound works on this. And I have what does the lawyer do? I don't know. What does a lawyer wear to court? A lawsuit. <laughs> So that would be my uh, little nephew, who hopefully is a uh, future ham, uh, presenting the lawyer joke for today. So uh, at least I know that uh, whenever I go to court, I'm supposed to be wearing a lawsuit. <laughs> so just a uh, refresher on the uh, project so far for those of you that haven't really seen the talk from last year um, and my goals. Um, I've got a uh, Altera socket board, an arrow socket board with an Altera Cyclone 5 system on a chip on it. So that's essentially a big file programmable gate array on the same die as a couple of ARM cores um, that run Linux. Hooked up to that, I have uh, a product called the SDR Stick HF2. Um, and that's made by a guy named Scotty Calling, who is a ham in the Phoenix area. 
Uh, and uh, it is an RF deck that hooks up to this thing that has an 122 mega sample per second ADC analog to digital converter on it um, that's just like a Hermes board or uh, that you may have heard of or any of the open HPSDR boards. It's the same chip on there. But he makes one that plugs into this arrow socket board. Um, and for those of you that are interested, I have a, a, a demo out there on the table where you can actually see the socket board hooked up to all this gear up and running and, and going. So part of my goal in this was to move much of the stuff that's in the FPGA um, into Linux instead because this system on a chip uh, runs Linux. Things that are just kind of foolish that we have in the FPGA implementations right now, things like DHCP. DHCP and FPGA gates is one, really stupid, um, and two, really wasteful. It's really stupid because it doesn't support a whole lot of the features uh, because it has to get implemented in Verilog in gates, in logic, which just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, there's also other things in the current Hermes board, like the IP stack, that is really stupid. It doesn't even understand a routing table. It can barely do ARP. Um, and it only understands how to respond to ARPs. It doesn't really understand how to get ARPs and put it into an ARP table. Um, and why is that? Because it's in Verilog and implemented in Gates. So why should we do that when I've got Linux out there that has a tried and true and bullet tested IP, uh, IP networking stack um, with everything that I want, a DHCP daemon that's fully featured and does everything I want and runs in software and I can take advantage of everything that's going on there. So move much of this FPGA code into Linux where it's appropriate. And the other goal in here is to maintain an appropriate kernel user space separation. So one of the problems that, uh, and why I'm rewriting some of this software is that Scotty's company has put a software image out for this thing, which is great. And it works and it does its job. The problem with it, in my view, coming from a guy that deals with uh, you know, Unix software and has for a long time, is that in order to get access to the samples in the hardware, they have a user land daemon, which is great. But what that user land daemon does is it opens dev mem and then pokes around in memory by itself, <laughs> which is not a good plan if you want to have a stable uh, and appropriate system. So my goal here has been to rewrite the FPGA to take out a lot of the junk that we don't need and can be done better in Linux, um, and to make sure that I have a device driver in Linux that will drive everything um, and make it go. So let's talk a little bit about the FPGA architecture that happens in these OpenHPSDR style systems. You have the input signal that's coming in from the analog to digital converter, and that's 122.88 mega samples per second at 16 bits, and these are real samples, which means I know if you've probably heard of I and Q, the in phase and quadrature components. This is not I and Q. This is real. This is just voltages coming off of the ADC. We haven't done that. Uh, we haven't done any processing to it yet. Um, and a back of the envelope calculation is that that is approximately 1.9 gigabits per second if you do 122.88 million times 16 bits a piece. So I can't run that to the computer. It's too much data to go over my one gigabit ethernet connection. I could get a 10 gig E connection, but it would make the radio so expensive that you wouldn't be able to afford it anymore. Well, maybe some of the Texas contesters would, but no normal human ham would. So after it comes out of the ADC, we go into a component that's called a cortic. Uh, and essentially, the cortic is the mixer. Um, and I, I can't talk a lot about the algorithm. I haven't dug really deeply into it. Um, but in a normal mixer, you would generally have a numerically controlled oscillator um, that would go into a mixer, which would just be multiplication. So in general, a mixer will be implemented with multiplication. Um, but we don't really want to do that on the FPGA because of uh, issues we'll talk about later, which are restricted device resources. So Cortic is nice because it can implement that mixing function only using addition and subtraction. So once we do that Cortic, we keep the sampling rate the same. It doesn't change the sampling rate, but we still have 122 mega samples per second at 22 bits, and now it's complex. So we have I and Q data because the Cortic does both an in-phase and a 90-degree out-of-phase component to it. And we do that to mix the signal down to whatever our our uh, uh, frequency of interest is. So if we want to tune in 10 megahertz, this mixer 
mixes everything down so we're now related to 10 megahertz. 10 megahertz is the zero frequency. But that's still a lot of data. That's actually a more data rate than what we got in because we now we've got 22-bit samples and we've got two 22-bit samples at the same data rate. So what we have to do is we have to uh, decimate that in order to get the data rate to be lower so that we can actually process it inside of the computer rather than in the FPGA. So we have to filter and decimate at this point in time. And there are two stages that implement that in the curb uh, hardware. One is called a CIC filter. It's a cascaded uh, integrate and comb filter. Um, and again, the reason why we use this is it is a filter where the math only requires addition and subtraction. And that's why we use that filter to go down even further. It provides initial decimation and we decimate by a factor of 320. So we take that 122 megahertz and we divide it by 320 and we end up with a signal that's now 384 kilosamples per second at 24 bits and it's a complex signal again where we've got two of them. And then we run into what's called a finite impulse response filter that provides the final decimation down to where we really want to be which is the output signal at 192 kilosamples per second at 24 bits with a complex signal again, so we have both I and Q. And that's small enough so now we can send it over the ethernet and it's small enough so that it's about, that signal is around five megabits per second across the ethernet at that point in time. So that's kind of the overall uh, structure of the FPGA, what it's doing as far as signal processing goes. So we were talking a lot about decimation. And decimation is essentially to reduce the data rate to ease the processing burden on all the stages that are afterwards. And as I said, the ADC produces about 1.966 gigabits per second. And this is a little bit, uh, the reason why we're doing all of this decimation is partially because of the signals we want to look at. And the mathematical sampling uh, theorem that covers sampling um, was by a guy named Shannon, obviously, uh, based on my so slide. And what it says that's interesting is that for a given sampling rate, if I'm sampling at 192,000 samples per second, I can represent any frequency up to half of that sampling rate. So an 192 kilosample per second sampling rate will support any frequency up to 96 kilohertz. That's very important. That's part of why the audio frequencies are the way they are, because a 48 kilohertz sampled audio signal is about 24 kilohertz, supports about a maximum frequency of 24 kilohertz. So which is about the highest that you could hear, probably beyond the highest that you could hear anyway. So that's part of what we're looking at here. The sampling rate determines how much you can see on that band scope that you're looking at on your SDR. That is the primary determiner is whatever your sampling rate is, you can see half of whatever that sampling rate is on your band scope. So that's part of why we do all this decimation because unless you want to see a 60 megahertz wide band scope, which isn't very practical to look at, we don't need all of that data in order to just give you an 192K or a 384K band scope. So we decimate it down because we really don't need all of that data. So in that cutoff frequency, um, if you look in the SDR documentation or papers that you see, is called the Nyquist frequency. Um, and one of the things you have to do, I don't think I talk about this later, one of the things you have to do when you're sampling like this um, is you actually have to have a low pass filter at the Nyquist frequency. Because one of the bad things that happens is if you don't, you get what are called aliases. So for example, if you don't have a filter and your Nyquist frequency is 50 megahertz, if there is a signal at 51 megahertz, it actually folds back and you will see it at 49 megahertz. So you don't want to leave a filter out, you don't want to leave the, the ADC there without the filter. You have to actually put a low pass filter a lot of times they'll call them a Nyquist filter or an anti-aliasing filter that's at the Nyquist frequency so you don't see any of that stuff that's above your frequency of interest and have aliasing in there. So that's part of why we're not just, decimation itself is easy. You just start throwing away samples. 
If you do a, a, a decimate by two, the easiest decimate by two function is you throw out every other sample. The problem with that is you haven't filtered it, so you will see aliasing all over the band unless you do some filtering involved with it. And that's what the CIC filter does and the fur, uh, the fur filter does inside of this FPGA. So I know that this is kind of complex stuff. I, I hope that people's eyes aren't glazing over all that much. If you do have questions, please stop me before the train rolls on, and I'm happy to try and address the questions as I go. I'm not opposed to people interrupting me and getting me off on another train of thought. So if you've got any questions, feel free to interrupt me in the middle. Uh, and for some reason, Kenny you know, budgeted me an hour and a half or something like that and, and cut Brian short. So I, I suppose that's because Kenny knows how my presentations tend to go, I guess. The other trick here is that since we have a complex sample, I and Q, that essentially means that we have twice the number of samples per sample period. So while the Nyquist frequency stays technically the same, um, because we have twice as many samples. So a 192 kilohertz complex signal, the Nyquist frequency is 192 kilohertz because we have twice the number of samples. And again, we talked about aliasing. If you merely decimate, you create aliases, which become a problem. Um, and it's actually a problem that I'm running into right now with my current filter design. The software filter apparently is not attenuating enough. Um, so what happens is as you tune um, near the edge of the band scope, um, if I tune my signal generator, I'll go towards 50. And then when I get off the other end, you'll actually see the signal boogie on in from the other end of the band scope. Um, and see it on that. It also makes weird patterns to the noise because you have noise aliasing into your signal and increasing the signal level of places. Um, so you can actually see this in action if you screw it up, which I have because I'm a software guy. What can I say? I'm also going to talk a little bit about FPGA resources because those determine why we're using those CIC filters and why we're using that Cortex stuff. And a lot of why I redesigned, I'm working on redesigning the filter chain in the first place. So in FPGA, as we covered last year, and some of you may not remember, I kind of described it as this primordial use of logic gates that you just download an image which connects them together into some useful logic circuit. And usually FPGAs are rated by the number of logic elements they have. So the System 5 SOC that I'm using in this project um, has 115,000 logic elements. Um, and you know the granularity of that, I'm not quite sure all the time. Other people would be able to tell me more. The way I envision it is it's the number of you know, AND gates and NOT gates and OR gates that are in there. It's actually a little bit bigger than that from what I understand. The logic elements are a little bit more complex. But the big deal and why it matters for me a whole lot is there's also a limited number of S, amount of SRAM on there. So there are SRAM units where I can keep intermediate calculations. That's important for what I'm doing for things like filter coefficients um, in the SDR. I have to be able to store those filter coefficients. Or if I have uh, delay lines that I need to bring samples into, those delay lines need to be stored in RAM. Um, and I don't want to go all the way out to ex ex external DRAM because that takes a lot of time. So there's SRAM inside of this chip, but there's only a limited amount of it. I need to make sure that I don't overflow that SRAM with the amount of stuff I have. Um, as we look later, we'll see that there are FIFOs in there that go to the processor. Those are also made of SRAM. So I, I only have a limited amount of those on the chip. And more importantly, for doing DSP, multipliers. Multiply is an expensive operation in a DSP, or in a FPGA, and there tends to be a limited number of multipliers, and they're only so big. Again, as an example, the SOC that I'm using only has, an 122, uh, only has 122 multipliers on it. So that's all the number of multiplies that you can do simultaneously. It's a lot of power when you think about it, because the FPGA can use all of those multipliers every clock cycle. But you have to manage that such that you pipeline the multipliers so that you can use them efficiently. They're 27 by 27 on Cyclone 5. Um, on Cyclone 4 and a lot of the lower ones, they're 18 by 18. So it depends on your uh, FPGA you're using. Um, and a lot of them have different modes for their multipliers as well. 
So for example, the Cyclone 4s I know can split their 18 by 18 multipliers into two 9 by 9 multipliers if that's what you need. Usually for our purposes in SDR, especially on HF SDR like we're looking at, where you need to have a lot of precision, carry a lot of bits, um, and, and have a lot of dynamic range, um, 18 by 18 multipliers are okay, but the 27 by 27 multipliers are better. Uh, one of the things that happens is when you're implementing a, a fur filter, the ultimate suppression that you can obtain with the, in the, uh, uh, the suppression band of the filter, the stop band of the filter, is related to how long your coefficients are. Um, so the longer the coefficients you have, in general, the better uh, attenuation in the stop band you get. So you'd like to use long coefficients in those. There is a, lo a limit on it, right? A ceiling that you, you can only get so much suppression, but the longer the coefficients, since in general, the better suppression you get. So I'm using these multipliers in 27 by 27 mode right now. So that's why we use a CIC filter, which is a cascaded integrate and comb filter. It's actually a single pole filter. Uh, it's a rather simple sort of thing. It only has two stages. And the big thing for uh, us is it uses only addition of subtraction. So those are cheap operations. They don't use my multipliers. Adders are fairly trivially implemented in the FPGA and don't use a lot of resources as compared to the uh, multipliers like an FIR filter, a fur filter would be. And that's kind of what the shape of the filter is. Um, but you get some trade-offs. This is a uh, decimate by eight filter that's being shown. So this is the first, this is uh, right here is where your Nyquist criteria is going to be. So as you can see, the filter shape drops off fairly slowly. And remember that right on the other side of this is where you're going to get aliases. And they're not going to be very well suppressed in that filter. So that's going to be a bad thing. So the transition band is really wide, and it's not flat either. Even within this transition band that's in here, it's not very flat. It drops off by 10 dB or so by the time you get to the end of the pass band. So that's not a very good characteristic for the filter when we finally get it in there. The good thing is we can compensate for that by using a regular finite impulse response filter that compensates for the shape. So you can see in this graphic, this is essentially the Nyquist frequency here. The blue is your CIC filter and the green is your finite impulse response filter. When you add those together, this compensates for the bad droop in the curve, so you'll end up with a flat curve all the way to the end. And in this in the case of this filter, you end up with you know, 40 dB or so of attenuation in your stop band. Also notice that unlike the uh, CIC filter, there's a narrow transition band. This is almost vertical. That's not really a, a entirely real filter, but even the real ones, you don't have very much transition in there in your transition band. As opposed to the transition band for this CIC filter is actually quite wide before you hit 6 dB down. You usually use them in low decimation factors. So you don't want to do like a decimate by 320 because it takes a lot of resources. And the most important thing is how this is implemented is essentially you have a number of taps that the filter has. And the filter has, a, each tap has a coefficient that is associated with it. And you say, say you have a 256 tap filter. You have 256 coefficients that are out there. And you keep the last 256 samples that you have, that you're processing. And, and you multiply them. So you essentially have a delay line where the last filter, that, the last sample that comes in gets multiplied by coefficient one. The next, the last sample gets multiplied by coefficient two. So, and so on and so forth, until you hit the number of the taps the filter has. So the filter actually has to do a multiply for each tap that you have in there. And say I have a 256 tap filter, if I were to do all of those in parallel on the FPGA, I couldn't do it because I only have 112 multipliers. So this is the dilemma that you run into and part of what I've been fighting. <clears throat> So that's kind of where the FPGA goes and, and why all of that is happening. There is also a, uh, at the end of that filtering chain, there is a FIFO, a first in, first out queue, um, that is presented to 
the pro hard processor system as just an address in memory. And as soon as you read an address out of memory, it pops something out of the FIFO um, and you grab another sample out of there. So in my system, there's a kernel driver that receives an interrupt from that FIFO at some configurable level and lets us know that the FIFO has a certain amount of number of entries in it. And then I go and read that. So the interrupt, uh, that should read interrupt handler, not the interrupt controller. The interrupt handler reads from the hardware FIFO, which is in SRAM that we talked about, um, and reads it into a software kernel FIFO. There's actually a, a nice Linux kernel interface called kFIFO um, that gives you all that stuff for free, essentially. So there's built-in calls and a library, so I, as the lazy programmer and even lazier lawyer, um, can uh, make sure that uh, uh, that works right because I'm using other people's code. And then it's essentially just a buffer zone where when I read with the read syscall, um, then I read out of that kernel FIFO and give it to the user land process. It's not very complex. Then there's a user land daemon that the kernel driver presents a device a file in the device files that just essentially gives you I and Q samples, 32-bit ints, I and Q, I and Q, I and Q. There's also a control interface in slash sys, which actually works really, really well. So if I want to change the frequency to which that slice is paying attention to, there's just a, a sys file that's uh, sys hpsdrrx0 slash frequency. And if you cat that file, you'll get the current frequency that the receiver is on. And uh, if you uh, write to that file, you'll change the frequency of the receiver. The sample rate works the same way. Yeah, Scott. So you're saying that you have an interrupt service routine that copies the, uh, the data from the FPGA over to kernel memory. Yes. And then you have another process that co copies that kernel data over to user data. Well, uh, yeah, the user land will copy out of the uh, kernel FIFO. It's right now not the most efficient thing in the world. The problem with the SRAM is that mapping that into kernel space is not going to be an easy task. So depending on what the performance is in it, I may end up doing DMAs directly into CPU memory. But that adds a bit of complexity that I'm not sure I need yet. Um, I'm, I'm waiting to get this all implemented. Um, it works as far as one receiver goes. I don't know how that's going to work when I get more than one receiver chain in there. Um, and uh, again, I'm afraid of premature optimization. If what I can get going works, it's a fairly simple and robust system, uh, and I don't want to worry about it. Uh, the issue here that I'm seeing is just interrupt rates, um, which isn't really going to change with DMA. I'm still going to have to have interrupts to figure out whether something is, is there or not. My concern is that my original architecture was to have an interrupt for every receiver, but if I have 50 or 60 of those, each, each interrupting a lot of times per second, I believe it's going to overload the CPU. So probably what I'm going to have is a single interrupt for all the receivers that when one of the receivers gets full, will process the interrupt by emptying all the receiver FIFOs out at the same time in the interrupt routine. But again, I'm not sure. I, I haven't implemented that, so I can't tell you how it works yet. Yeah. <laughs> well, as long as you don't mind a stupid answer, then I think we're all good. So you've got 122 multipliers. Yes. And lots and lots of batteries. All yes. You can possibly want. Well, not all you can possibly want. There's still a limited amount, but they're they're cheaper than a multiplier. Or somebody very very old. Uh huh. Is an obvious solution here. Yeah. Uh, there are room for tables, but remember, any tables that you have will go into those SRAM components. So even when you, you instantiate a ROM in the FPGA, how the ROM is implemented is essentially a RAM that's pre-filled with values at, at load time on there. So you use those precious SRAM resources um, to do that. But that is a way that people do implement some of these filters when you have a limited number of bits so if you only had like 8-bit coefficients or something like that, um, one of the ways you could do it would be to mul uh, figure out all the possible things and you know, come up with an approximation through a lookup table. And that does happen. Um, but for our particular purposes, the lookup table would probably be relatively large and uh, would not fit in the available device resources. So the, the dance that happens with the FPGAs is figuring out how many resources you have and tailoring your codes to not overflow those. Um, and the reason why I went down, again, went down this rat hole is that I took the existing FPGA code out of the OpenHTSDR project 
and put it into my project. And I got it compiled up, and when I looked at it, it worked. And, uh, the receiver worked, and I thought everything was good. Uh, and then I looked at the uh, report that came out of the uh, compiler for the FPGA, and it said that out of the DSP blocks in there, 20% of them were used, and I had only implemented one receiver in it. And that made me scratch my head and thinking, that means I can only put five slice receivers in this thing, and that's not what I was envisioning with an 115,000 logic element uh, FPGA. So when I looked further into it, I figured, that these, figured out that these DSP blocks actually contained the multipliers. So the Cyclone 5 doesn't have standalone multipliers. They have these DSP blocks that have a multiplier plus some nice supporting hardware around them as well, as well that we can talk about. So I once I figured out where they were multipliers, I looked at the current code um, and figured out that every slice receiver was using 16 multipliers because of the way it was coded. And looked at that and scratched my head and said, I, I think that could probably be done better in less multipliers, which will allow me to cram more slice receivers on here. So this is the motivation for me retooling all of this stuff and jumping into hardware land, is to be able to fit more than five or six receivers on this thing. Uh, because one of my visions is that I have this Linux box that can just read samples out of device files. Well, I have one user land daemon that speaks, speaks HPSDR protocol. Maybe I can have another user land daemon that speaks the GHPSDR protocol. Uh, maybe I can have another one that uh, uh, the video on this is going to go out and Steve from Flex is going to kill me, but we can emulate a Flex radio with some of this stuff. Once we have the samples into Linux, it becomes a lot easier to write daemons that will do that. And to make that flexible and so that I can potentially handle one computer speaking to the hardware over OpenHPSDR, the other computer speaking to the hardware over Flex Radio Protocol, and maybe a third computer out there that's you know two hops down the network or whatever speaking to it, I want to have a lot of slice receivers in order to be able to service all of them. Um, and that, the, the way that things were currently designed didn't fit my envisioning of that. So that's why I went down this rat hole, um, is because I didn't think I could fit enough device resources on there um, to be able to accomplish what I'm going to do. And the ultimate solution that I've come up with that I'm still struggling with only uses two multipliers instead of 16. So it's a lot better. So the user land daemon also deals with all the network traffic. So it takes all the samples in from the device files, packages them up into UDP packets, and sends them out. Um, and it's multi-threaded so that uh, one thread, you know, uh, one thread handles each of the clients that's out there um, and deals with giving them their data. So that's kind of the architecture of what's going on. Yeah. K7 EJ, uh, I have a question for you. How do you determine the sampling rate of your voice data? Well, the voice data sampling rate. Um, eventually ends up just being how much do you want to, uh, what frequencies do you want to represent out of the voice. So say for an HF channel, right, if I'm trying to do an, a single sideband signal um, and I'm trying to decode that on my HF SDR, uh, a single sideband signal is about 3K wide, 2.7 to 3K. So my sampling rate, again, using the Nyquist theorem, is going to have to be five or six kilosamples per second in order to do that. So you're looking for quality voice, or are you just looking for the least amount that will do the effective communication? Well, remember, again, we're talking about legacy protocols here. So we're not talking about digital voice. We are sampling an analog signal and trying to represent that. And since your Yaesu or ICOM radio um, in its SSB circuit is going to have like a 2.7K filter in it, my, my RF signal is only going to be 2.7K wide. So it doesn't matter to me on the SDR end. I, it does me no good to sample it at 48K because there's no information beyond the 2.7 kilohertz wide signal, right? Um, so what, it, what eventually ends up happening in most of the SDRs um, is that you will have a digital filter somewhere in there that's 2.7K wide. The only reason that it's not at a smaller sampling rate is where do I have to put that 2.7K signal into? I have to put that into a DAC that's going to give me audio. The DAC is at 48K per second. So I just ship it out. I do it at 48K per second, but implement a software filter. Um, now that's not to say if I had an audio device like the older audio devices that were like nine kilosamples per second into them, nine kilohertz sample rate, um, I could get a HF signal and essentially lose no clarity out of it because my filter is narrow and I can represent all the frequencies that are in that 
that three uh, two point seven k. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Are there other questions? Let's yeah. Do any it. other questions before I kind of go on to the part two ranting about bitchy software guys dealing with FPGAs and hardware and things like that? I mean, I guess you can already tell by the the slide title that this is this is going into the ranting piece of this. So I've come up with my hierarchy of pain and suffering. At the top with, with small amounts of pain and suffering is, is the user land software component of this. And, and I liken that to uh, poison oak. It's like getting a, a case of poison oak. It's a little bit itchy and irritating and uh, sometimes you run into frustrations writing the user land software, but they're more irritating than anything else. Kind of the next point down on the pain and suffering is the kernel driver code. And I liken that to a root canal. You know, there are a lot of different problems with it. Your tool set goes down, and we'll talk about the reason why there's pain and suffering in here in the later slides. But the kernel driver hurts, and you're going to be sore for a few days after tangling with it. Um, but it, it's manageable. FPGA firmware is like amputation without anesthetic. It really hurts, and, and it kind of leaves you permanently maimed after you get done with it. And I'm not really sure I'm ever going to be the same. <laughs> so Brian's probably going to uh, you know, object and or throw tomatoes at me or, or something, but that's OK. We let him do that. <laughs> so one of the reasons for this pain and suffering is the debugging tools you get in all of this stuff. User land, we're pretty freaking spoiled. We've got GDB for as a debugger to do debugging in here that I can set breakpoints, I can do nice stuff in there, I can print stuff, I can examine memory, I can do all sorts of cool stuff. Stepping through it, GDB is awesome. And even if I'm too lazy to load it up in GDP, GDB, if I put printfs in there, I can print out all sorts of cool information out of it um, and figure out where the loop is breaking or whatever, it's pretty awesome. I can do some flexible debugging stuff. Um, and get down to the bug fairly quickly. The kernel is a little bit more difficult. I still got uh, KDB, which is the kernel debugger, but it doesn't tell me as much, and it's a lot harder to use, and uh, there are some limitations to it as compared to debugging uh, user land programs in the debugger. Um, and I do have kprintf, where I can print stuff out of the kernel to the console and things, and that can be useful, although kprintf in an interrupt handler uh, that runs a few thousand times a second doesn't really do you much good and tends to lock up the machine, which isn't really great either. But compared to that, FPGAs are a whole nother world of debugging hurt. Cause, because the equivalent of a printf in an FPGA is an LED. And a lot of times it's coming down to, is the LED blinking? Yes or no? Well, I guess something might be happening in there. And writing complex implementations of Morse code to printf out to you isn't very practical on an FPGA. So you don't really have printfs in there to do very much for you. One of the bright spots, which I will personally thank in public Brian Hoyer for you know, bringing to the community, is something called SignalTap. And it's essentially a built-in logic analyzer that you put this chunk of code in your FPGA and it talks over the JTAG interface, and you can tap certain points in your design, which is cool. But it is not the easiest thing to use, and there's only a limited number of taps that you can, places that you can tap in the circuit. And essentially, when you change your tap points, you pretty much have to recompile the FPGA image, which is a pain and takes, you know, as we'll see in the future slide, it, it takes a bit of work to do. So the debugging tools for FPGAs as compared to user land codes is really primitive um, and difficult. And if you run into even the you know, stage beyond that, if you're looking at, so you have to look at signals on the external of the FPGA, well, you have to have a hardware logic analyzer and play that game. Which for a software guy, and remember the point of this talk is a software guy in hardware land, this is all a pain. This is uncomfortable. I don't like this stuff. So. Uh, because I'm lazy and I use software. Another issue is Verilog, which for those of you that don't know, Verilog is a hardware definition language, although language I think is probably used loosely. Um, Verilog is what you use to write your FPGA code in, so, and there are problems with Verilog. 
One of the big things when you go as a software guy and look at Verilog that you have to understand is that there is a paradigm change that you have to make here. Um, and because when you are coding as a software programmer, you are coding instructions that you count on the processor doing one after the other in order, um, and you're evaluating, and it flows through the program. That is not the true for a hardware definition language. Your code gets compiled down to an image that represents a circuit. So you are designing a circuit by defining it in software. The problem with Verilog from a software point of view, software guy's point of view, is it looks a whole lot like C or any other programming language. But when you get down to how it acts, it's not like that. So a problem with Verilog is vendors, in my experience over the past couple years in dealing with it, vendors only really implement what they want. So there's an IEEE spec out there for Verilog, but brand X, which if you know anything about FPGAs, you'll know what I'm talking about, and brand A decide, ah, well, that doesn't seem like a part of the spec I really feel like implementing, so screw it. Our customers don't want that. We're just not going to do it. It would be like you know GCC deciding, oh, well, our customers don't use printf that much, so we're just not going to implement it in the C library. It's in the spec, but screw the spec. We don't really need that. And the more infuriating thing is different manufacturers implement different subsets of the language. So, um, and that will come important when we talk about some of the other debugging tools. And as I said, you have to remember that you are creating hardware here. Things like a for loop in a uh, regular language, you know that the compiler is going to go through there, a certain the processor is going to go through, through there a certain number of times and create, you know, do whatever the instructions inside the for loop are. When you create a for loop in Verilog, it can't do that because it's not executing instructions, it's making hardware. So it will create X copies of whatever the hardware is inside of the loop. That poses some problems for a programmer that may be used to doing something like, I don't know where the end of the loop is. Because the end of the loop could change at runtime compared to compile time. You can't do that with Verilog. Verilog has to know at compile time where the end of the loop is. Otherwise, it can't get implemented in hardware. Because otherwise, it doesn't know how many copies of the hardware to synthesize. And it can't synthesize hardware on the fly. It has to know what that is to start out with. So that is a confusing aspect of software guys to realize. And a really infuriating part is Verilog is used for both test benches and writing, a, uh, writing hardware itself. So you can write a test bench in Verilog that tests your production code. That means that there are actually features in the language that you can write, and the simulator will happily deal with them and execute it and things like that. But when you go and try and compile it into hardware, your hardware compiler will say, no, sorry, can't do that. A notable one is floating point. FPGAs, in general, do not support floating point. If you try and declare a floating point, Altera's compiler will tell you to go home. So you just can't do it. But if you're doing it only in the simulator, the simulator will happy to happily take your float. It'll execute it, and you won't know anything until you try and go and compile it. And that's part of the test bench versus implementation. There are a bunch of features in there that are designed for test benches um, that won't implement. But the language spec doesn't really tell you which ones are which. And you just kind of have to know through trial and error what's going to happen or understanding what you're doing or pouring through the documentation. Um, there's no thing that says floats aren't allowed in synthesizable code. Another irritation about all this stuff is the build time. So for my user land daemon, and these are actual numbers, I did this, uh, I guess, two nights ago. If I make the user land daemon, it takes a tenth of a second to compile that thing up in real time, 0.132 seconds. So that means that if I make a mistake, I can change the code, and within a second or so, I can have a new version of the daemon and execute it and run it. Quick turnaround time, which is what we're used to these days with agile programming and things like that. The kernel module is a little bit slower. I can't complain, though, because it's only about a second to compile the kernel module for this thing. And that's not bad, either. I can make changes in the kernel module, unload the old one, load it up, test it out. Uh, it's not too big a deal to do the uh, compile and test cycle on that. 
The FPGA image for this, implementing one receiver, one receiver, not the entire design that's eventually going to be in there, takes 12 minutes to compile up. 12 minutes to get to an image on it. And when I put signal tap in there, it's probably twice as long to compile it because there's more stuff to go through. So it takes a long time, this idea of compiling it up and getting it out to the hardware to try and, try and test it becomes less and less able to be done. And remember, that's 12 minutes for a successful compile. Say I put a, a non-synthesizable piece of code in my Verilog by mistake. I wait eight minutes for that thing to get through with the synthesized stage, only for it to say, sorry, I can't do that. You haven't done time enclosure. I haven't done any of the time enclosure. I haven't done any of the other stuff on there. Yeah. That, that's just to design it and, and see if it works. So again, part of the pain and suffering here, and part of why this is amputation without anesthetic, is the compile and test cycle is really long on this. So in order to try and avoid some of the compile and test cycles, we've got this thing called Model Sim, which is made by this great Oregon company, yay Oregon, in the Portland area, called Mentor Graphics. It's called Model Sim. And Model Sim simulates uh, Verilog code for you. But there are some issues with Model Sim. It's useful for at least checking your syntax before you do your 12-minute compile, because there's nothing worse to figure out that you forgot a semicolon and the Quartus tools tell you again about seven or eight minutes into your compile that you, you know, didn't put a semicolon in there. Model Sim compiles pretty quickly, so it'll tell you within a couple seconds whether your code at least will pretend to run. So it's a useful tool for that. And in, in addition, it's free, it comes free with Altera's development tools, which are available for free on the web. Unfortunately, it supports, it, it is really good about supporting the breadth of the Verilog language. It supports almost the entire spec, which means that some stuff you can run in Model Sim, and then you try and compile it in Altera's compiler, and Altera's compiler just doesn't support it. My big example that Brian's heard about about five times over this weekend is I have a piece in there where I have, uh, I have a big accumulator that I need to select 24 bits out of. But depending on the decimation level, I need to select a different 24 bits out of that. And the calculation to figure out what the most significant bit is involves log two, which inherently is a floating point function. Well, in model sim, model sim will calculate floats for you. And it shouldn't be a problem because the bit is always, the bit I select is always going to be an integer value. So that integer value can be figured out at compile time. So it doesn't, bear, uh, it doesn't violate the fact that the FPGA doesn't do floats itself. The problem being that model sim will go ahead and cal calculate that constant to me using floats and do the right thing uh, and come up with an answer and the code works great. But as soon as you try and run that code, you know, compile that code in Quartus, which is the Altera tools, it says, sorry, can't use floats, even though the float will never be used in the design. So Model Sim supports more of the spec than the hardware tools do. So you can easily make mistakes where you put stuff in there that just won't build when you get down to it. And the other irritation from a software guy's point of view is, Model Sim is just enough like GDB and stuff like that to be annoying, where it, it, it's like, you know, it's like Diet Coke for me. It, it kind of tastes the same, but there's just something off about it, right? All the little irritations in there that aren't, just aren't like you're used to. It's just enough to fool you into it's a debugger, but, but it's just not. The other tool that I've used extensively in this is that it isn't necessarily an FPGA tool and uh, isn't uh, uh, really in the hardware thing, but goes to part of this design is MATLAB. And the reason I'm using MATLAB is for filter design. So it's got this nice filter visualization tool where you can look at what you expect the response of the filter to be. Uh, MATLAB's also nice because if you get what's called the fixed point uh, kit, um, then MATLAB will estimate what your quantization error and things like that are so that you can design filters for an FPGA which doesn't have floating point math on it. And it's useful for that. 
the downsides of it is MATLAB is its own programming language in and of itself. Um, and it's yet again a different one. Um, it doesn't look like C. It doesn't look like anything else I've seen. It's its own little world. So you end up having to learn yet another language just to try and figure out what your co filter coefficients are. And unfortunately, as I'm experiencing with the aliasing problem I'm having, MATLAB doesn't seem to tell me the whole story all the time. Um, it's telling me that it's got suppression, but it's not really telling me uh, what I need to know in order to make sure that that filter's okay. The caveat is that MATLAB is so big and so hairy um, that there's likely pieces that I'm missing in there um, that I haven't learned about yet. Uh, and I'm sure that MATLAB can be a really powerful tool if you're a professor at, at the engineering department, um, but learning that whole tool is going to be a long road. Um, there's also Simulink where you can actually simulate radio links and radio stuff in there um, that I haven't, it's complex enough that a software engineer turned lawyer like me can't even penetrate some of the how to use it. So, uh, and that's another ding on MATLAB is it's, it's relatively complex to learn how to use. Part of the good thing about MATLAB though is it's a powerful tool and they actually have an amateur slash experimenters license for it. Um, where for a couple hundred bucks you can get most of the stuff that an amateur radio experimenter would want. Um, and it really is very powerful. So that's kind of my rant for today and, and kind of the status of the project. I do have a, uh, uh, like I said, a demo out there and you guys are more than uh, welcome to come and ask me questions uh, about what I've experienced and what the current status of the project is, what the cost of some of these boards are. So if you guys want to go and play with some of this stuff, if you guys want to go down the rat hole and, and saw your arm off without anesthetic, I'm more than happy to help you do such a thing because uh, misery loves company. So I'll, I'll take any questions um, from people if they have them. Yeah, Scott. Yes, um, does, is VHDL available to you for either Altair or Xilinx uh, parts? There is a VHDL compiler in Quartus. Okay. I haven't explored it yet because all the existing code I know about uh, um, is in Verilog and uh, I want to be using what all the other project people are using so I can borrow stuff. And you'd like to have one good arm? Yeah, yeah. I, yeah learning very HDL may require me amputating the other arm, so. Okay, so a brief history of HDLs. First, there was Verilog. Cadence owned it. It was proprietary. The HDL was a government spec, much like ADA, designed for system specification. When you make an IC, the golden simulator, the one you buy off on, is always in Verilog. A few years back, EE Times ran a contest. We gave a bunch of digital engineers a task and said, code this out in Verilog, code it out in VHDL. When they got done, two thirds of the VHDL guys could not finish the task, and only half of those worked. The Verilog guys all finished it, and mostly it worked. Now, if you're in the military, they demand it, and if they demand it, then that's what you should use. A lot of hardware guys do their, um, back to your point about what's implementable, they, they'll do their um, chip design in Verilog, but they'll write the test bench in VHDL, because VHDL is more powerful and flexible. Any other questions? Or answers. Or, yes, or answers. <laughs> So I do have these the helpful pictures of FPGA developers in their natural habitat with stone tablets and, and stone tools trying to chisel out their, their hardware design. <laughs> All right, thank you, Jeremy.